This is kind of like a tour of the life of Christ. I have been convinced, thoroughly convinced, that it is theologically the most profound spiritual prayer for any Christian, not just for a Catholic, that exists. This idea of having these beads yes. strung on rope, can you tell us the history of yeah. what, how this originated? Sure. And many people don't pray the rosary well. The most important part of mental prayer or meditation is to speak to Christ in that scene. What was that room like? that room when Mary received this message and she said yes to the angel, yes to God. We're asking to share in the incarnation. Yes. What you're saying because- Give me goosebumps. It is at the invocation of the angel Gabriel when he says to the Virgin Mary, hail full of grace, where Mary says, thy will be done, let it be done to me according to thy word. All of salvation history changes. Gabe Castillo, welcome to the podcast. Lila, thanks for having me. It's an honor to be on your program. I consider you one of the best not only podcasters, but best female speakers in the Christian space. And I wanna thank you for doing such a good job of representing the pro-life movement in circumstances that are hostile. You've done beautifully. You're an example of grace and truth and goodness. So it's an honor to be here, seriously. Thank you, Gabe. I mean, that's that's very kind. It's true. That's pumped me up right well, up, right you're, off you're the get-go. I love you're it. Good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, I'm a big fan of what you're doing. Thank you and how you're using media. You've got a YouTube channel, you've got an incredible story, you've got some, I'm gonna call it campaigns sure, that you're yeah. running, let's call it that. Yeah. So a lot to unpack here, but first of all, who is Gabe Castillo? Um, I'm actually just figuring this out now. <laughs> so I grew up without a father and I didn't realize until recently how deeply that impacted me. Um, I grew up also without God, which is a major, downside. But then I didn't realize how not having a father also impacted not having a relationship with God. Because if you don't know about God, at least you have a mother and a father who are kind of like an image of the Trinity for you. And so I'm just now discovering not only how deeply wounded I have been by not having a father in my life, but then because I'm like aware of this hole in my life, I really started looking into the role of fatherhood, especially from the teachings of Pope John Paul II and from the writings of St. Paul, I'm realizing that there's people with father wounds who had fathers uh, and they weren't living up to the revelation of God the Father that all men are, cr are created to do. And it's, I think especially of that scripture verse where St. Paul says, husbands love your wives like Christ loved the church and handed himself over for I always forget this last part, or at least I did until recently, for her sanctification. And so Jesus is asking men to sacrifice for their spouses and to pray for their spouses and to offer masses for their spouses and to pray the rosary for their spouses to become saints. And so I have not seen that in very many couples and in families. And so I think that people are more deeply wounded by a lack of fatherhood than maybe they realize even. What does that look like when you say, like I'm saying, who Gabe Castillo? You said, right. "Well, I'm figuring it out, and I yeah. have father wounds." Okay, what is what is that? What does that look like for you? Um, so my wounds are seeing that I'm trying to prove myself, and I'm not knowing where this drive to try and prove myself is coming from. Um, that realizing that because I, I'm like, why do I do the things that I do? And it's mm -hmm. from not having a father growing up. And then just learning to love my wife and to sacrifice for her and to pray for her to become a saint and to grow in holiness and to offer. So now I got, I'm very intentional about every mass at the consecration. I'm praying for my wife to become a saint, to go straight to heaven at the hour of her death. Um, and I pray at least one rosary for my wife specifically every single day. Um, so it's beginning to define who I am, but it really defined who I was when I was in high school because not having God and not having a father to love my mom uh, I was very confused about my meaning in life, my purpose, and about sexuality. So I was trying to find meaning and purpose from anywhere that I could. And I was a latchkey child, so my mom was working two jobs to try and make ends meet, which is one of the effects of not having a father in the home. And I was gaining my identity from MTV, which at the time was just like, there was a show called Sex in the 90s, which was like so perverse, like so perverse. And I accepted that as my identity and my goal in life. And so I got- How it. old were you? I was like mm, 10th grade, 9th grade. I was exposed to pornography in the eighth grade, but I didn't, I wasn't like, I didn't go towards it. But then once I started hearing these programs say, you know, 
sex with yourself and all sorts of other perversions. Um, I was like, well, pornography, that's great. That's moral. That's fine. And so I got addicted to it very strongly, very heavily. Um, but the saving grace was that my mom, although she didn't have God in her life and we didn't have a father, she had a lot of practical wisdom and she was very strict. So I, I didn't go off the rails as badly as I could have. And my grades were really, really good. So I graduated in the top 1% of my high school. And so I got essentially a full scholarship to the University of St. Thomas, which is a, a very good private Catholic school in Houston. And I was forced to take core classes in philosophy and in theology. And I had zero religious formation, zero. I had made my first communion in the eighth grade. I don't even know how that happened. Like they just gave me communion. It, would you go to mass on Sundays growing no, up? No, definitely not. Okay. No, they, but we, you. But your mom was Catholic. My but it mom wasn't was like culturally practicing. Catholic. Okay. Basically, she just prayed the Saint Jude Novena whenever she needed something. Aww. So she had <laughs> she had left the church for a long time, and she says, I don't know, I wasn't around, but I take her word for it that the priest didn't want to baptize me because she wasn't married, and so because of that, that hurt her deeply, and that rejection from the church made her in return reject the church and so there may have been more than that i don't know it feels like there might be were, more than were that. you baptized i Gabe? was baptized yeah i was baptized and i made my first communion when i was in the eighth grade. because that's not the church's teaching right i agree yeah no i know yeah i, I tried to explain like that, that to that her that priest was that yeah. priest was confused yeah he was very confused so so were you a, you were baptized as a newborn so i was baptized as a newborn okay. and then just basically stayed away from church until my grandmother died and it was her dying wish that I made my first communion. So I made my first communion and that was it. We never went back to church. And only child? Only child, single parent. Yes. So it was like, and then there's disorder that's involved in that as well, because usually a mother and a father give each other attention and there was no father for her to give attention to. So I became like the center of her world, which was a little bit disordered in a way. So there was just so much disorder going on. Um, but being accepted into the University of St. Thomas and taking the philosophy of the human person and intro to Catholicism, I began to see that the Catholic Church, and this is a great consolation for anybody who's considering being Catholic or is questioning their faith, the Catholic Church objectively, like you can look at it historically, you can look at it scripturally, you can look at it theologically with an open mind if you're searching, and it just makes so much sense. And it made sense of especially what really struck me was concupiscence. So my mom and I, we loved each other. We were the only people that we had in each other's lives to depend on, but we were constantly fighting and like ugly fights where we'd curse at each other and like just say things that no parent should say to a child and no child should say to a parent. Um, and I didn't wanna hurt her and I was. And the church made sense to me like, well, you have a disordered inclination to do bad things. We call that concupiscence, pride of life, the concupiscence of the eyes, concupiscence wounded of the flesh. Sin, like the yeah, woundedness sin, yeah. of the Yeah, so I was sin. like, this makes so much sense. Was that the first time you had really understood that? That yeah, class I've never in heard, college? I've never heard any of this stuff. Like I, I had to take, they had the core requirement of intro to sacred scripture. I took it three times because I failed the first two times because I had no idea who these people were, who the apostles were. Like, and I'm a, I'm a youth minister full time now. And that's the same thing. I'll get high school students coming into my youth program and they won't know what a saint is. They won't know who Jesus was. Like they know he's an important person. They don't know that he had 12 apostles. They don't know anything about. So it's like I was basically experiencing what I now realize is the overwhelming majority of Catholics. But I was so convicted intellectually of Catholicism that I was like, this is the truth. But I viewed the truth as a philosophy. It wasn't a, a relationship with Jesus Christ. I was still hooked on pornography. I was trying to hook up with every single girl that I could find uh, or that would accept me. Uh, for some reason, a lot of them realized that I was, you know, a, a dirtbag at the time. Um, but a religious sister gave me a brown scapular, and maybe we'll talk about it later. And looking back, I realized that that was a turning point where grace slowly began to enter into my heart. And shortly after that, a lot of my friends who I was drinking with and partying with on not only on the weekends, but every day of the week, uh, they were going to receive the sacrament of confirmation. And so I thought to myself, I'm convicted of this stuff philosophically, and they're just as bad as I am. So why can't I also receive the sacrament of confirmation? 
And part of that process was going on a retreat. And uh, on this particular night of the retreat, they said, we're going to go and have Eucharistic adoration. And I was like, okay, cool. What's that? We're going to go look at Jesus and you're going to pray to him. And I was like, what do you mean I'm going to look at Jesus? Like I understood praying to Jesus, but what am I even going to look at him? Like we can look at pictures of Jesus. And they're like, no, in the Eucharist. I was like, again, what are you talking about? Well, we believe that that little white circle is Jesus Christ. I was like, really? Yeah, we do. I was like, are you sure? <laughs> and like the, the real Jesus? Like, yeah, we believe that. I was like, so can you tell me what exactly is going to happen in this chapel that we're going to? Can you give me some instructions? And this was my philosophy teacher at the time. So I really trusted him. He's a great uh, professor, Dr. Ted Rebard. And he says, look, just go in there, kneel down and repeat the name of Jesus. And I was like, for an hour? He's like, well, you don't have to do the whole hour. So I went in, I knelt down for about 10 minutes. I was just looking at the Eucharist and repeating the name of Jesus in my mind. And I was just like, okay, this is really dumb. Jesus, 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 Jesus. And then 10 minutes passes. And I hear an internal voice say, my son, be quiet. And of course, like I was like, okay, I'm starting to go crazy. I'm just looking at the circle for too long. And then I just kept repeating the name of Jesus for a couple more minutes. And then all of a sudden, it wasn't audible, but I heard the same thing. My son, I love you, be quiet. But at the same time that I heard it, it was as if God put his finger into my soul and melted my icy heart and I just crumbled interiorly. And as my heart melted, my face melted and like tears were just streaming down my face. And I was like crying the deepest sob, the ugliest cry. Um, and looking back on it, it's like as if every wound that I'd ever experienced in my life was like ripped open. And I was having interior mental pictures of the passion of Christ. I had the movie hadn't come out yet, so I didn't have this like idea that Jesus suffered and died and you know experienced extreme torment. But these images were in my mind, and I just knew one God loved me, and two this was really, 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 truly, substantially this was really the person of Jesus Christ, the same person who walked this earth two thousand years ago. And afterwards, my friends were like, are you okay? Is everything going on? And I, I was not okay. I was like, that is Jesus Christ. Like, yeah, we know. I was like, no, you don't know. That is really, really, really Jesus. And I have to live like that's really Jesus. Like I have to change my life. And so I did. It became second nature for me every single day to visit Jesus in the chapel as if he was really and truly present. And my life if my friends didn't know where I was at, if I was not where I normally am, they would be like, he's in the chapel. He's always in the chapel. And I had a girlfriend at the time and we weren't living a pure Christian life. And I was even ready to break up with her because I asked her, I was like, do you love Jesus in the Eucharist? And she's like, of course I do. And I said, well, then why don't you ever visit him? Why, aren't, why don't you go to mass? Because I was going to daily mass, but at the same time, I was living in mortal sin and not trying to stop. Did you know that what that even was, mortal sin? I, I just knew I was doing bad things, that I wasn't living the life that God had called me to. I, my Again, my morality was very perverse. I was actually reflecting this morning on how perverse it was that I had had the idea to donate sperm to make money. And one of the kids in campus ministry, like I was like telling him this, I was like, dude, I got a great idea to make money. And he's like, are you crazy? And I was like, what's wrong with that? It's a great idea. And he's like, that's so immoral. And I was like, how is that immoral? Like, I had no idea. Like my morality was so skewed. So donate sperm meaning for like a sperm bank. Yeah, I, yeah. I didn't know. I didn't know this. I didn't know the, the, the business side of it, but I thought I heard that you can make money doing that. So my morality was way off track. But at the same time, I was going to the chapel every single day, praying, going to mass every single day. I volunteered to become a Eucharistic minister. And at the time I saw my peers who were in campus ministry, because I was hanging out in campus ministry. At the time I saw them as like, you know, Bible beaters, you know, holy rollers. I was like very uh, pessimistic about them. But now I look back and I'm like, man, thank goodness that they were so convicted of their faith that one, they were willing to call me out and they even got the campus minister involved who is a religious sister, a great religious sister who I love from the depths but, of my soul. But call you out because like obviously the sperm donation thing, it would be well, a red Because flag, I was but... living like a duplicitous life. So you would be going and going to receive Holy Communion, right. going to mass like this yeah. Catholic and, guy. And 
distributing Holy Communion at Mass. And doing sperm donations. But I didn't actually do that. Okay, but like, okay, all right, but all right. Like, but going to parties, drinking, okay. trying to hook up. And they were on to you and they're like, who is this guy? Like, what is he doing? Did like, you know when you would go to receive Holy Communion that you weren't allowed to technically because of being in mortal sin? I, I, there was a disconnect. You said it didn't there click. There was a disconnect. It did not wow. click. I'm so excited to introduce a must listen, extremely bingeable new podcast brought to you by Coronation Media. The podcast is called Fire Breaker and is a fictional rendition of the story of St. George and the Dragon. It was created by fathers to introduce strong Christian heroes for their boys and girls to look up to. And let's be honest, we're living in a time where there isn't an emphasis on moral character of strong male characters for young boys in media. The Princess 2 in Firebreakers is a model of Christian virtue, just like what I'd hope my daughter to grow up to be like. Firebreakers is done in old school radio style with sound effects and is guaranteed to engage your kids. The portrayal of dragons as captivating symbols of evil is masterfully executed. It's kind of like spiritual warfare training for your kids. Plus the podcast features captivating voice performances, including Wizards of Waverly Place star, David Henry, and The Chosen's Elizabeth Tabish, who plays Mary Magdalene, as well as a full orchestra score by a Hollywood producer, Kevin Casca. The podcast Firebreakers is available on Apple and Spotify for free. So go download it right now or visit firebreakerseries.com. That's firebreakerseries.com. It just didn't, it didn't click. There was a disconnect. It did not wow. click. But the campus minister, we were having a meeting about Lent and what we were going to give up for Lent. And I was still so oblivious. I was like, for Lent, I'm going to give up chocolate. And then she was like, no, like, no, you have to give up sin. <laughs> like, you have to stop. Like, what's wrong with you? And so what, I was, did, how, what did you, when people would, when these people thank God for them, they were yeah. so direct with you. What, what, how did, what were you offended? How no, did you feel? I was like kind of confused. I was like, oh, I didn't know that. I was, I was, I, it was like a mental, I was like, I can't explain it. I don't, I, it just, it, it didn't offend me when the sister was like, what's wrong with you? Like, I was like, wow, it's a good idea. So, I mean, it sounds like it's, it's your conscience wasn't formed. You didn't have formed, the understanding, right. which by the way, I know I mentioned mortal sin yeah. just a moment ago for the soul to be in the state of mortal sin, right. they have to have full knowledge yeah. as well as full consent. Yeah, right. Sounds like you didn't have full knowledge that right. what you were doing was right. so At bad. At some point, it that doesn't so just like, I, I knew that what I was doing was bad and I was going doing it anyways, but I think I, I might've destroyed my conscience, mm. um, especially concerning sins of the flesh. And that day after the sister confronted me and was like, dude, you need to, like, you cannot be living this life. Like people are reporting certain things. And I went home, I was like, you know what? I'm never gonna look at pornography again and I'm not gonna commit a solitary sin, like masturbation in that case. And within 30 minutes, I fell back into mortal sin. Like at that moment, I broke down crying because one, I think God gave me the grace of true contrition. And I realized I have a problem. Like I did not wanna do this. And when I was crying and I was expressing my sorrow to God, because I, I loved God, I was visiting him, I was spending my time with him. I recognized my wickedness and I, I verbally was praying. I said, Lord, I'm so sorry, please forgive me. I have a problem. I heard audibly of a very high pitched, screeching, ugly voice that I can't even, I, I couldn't even try to replicate it with my own human voice. In my ears, audibly, I heard the exact same words that I was praying to God, but in a mocking voice. And I don't know what got into me, the Holy Spirit or my guardian angel, something prompted me. And I immediately said, St. John Vianney, pray for me. And Did I- Did you know who that was? I don't think so. I, maybe I had heard his name before, but I only learned later that he had been somebody who fought with the devil and was getting attacked by him. And immediately when I said those words, that voice went away. So the next day I went to campus ministry. I didn't tell the sister what had happened but I think she knew that something had gotten into me. And I said, Is, can I get a pamphlet on the rosary? And I need a rosary. And I took it home because I was afraid because the last time I'd went to bed, I had heard a scary voice. So on my bed, I opened the pamphlet and I began to see, okay, well, how do you pray this thing? I believe in the moment that I said, I believe a force physically grabbed me, pinned me on my bed, held me down by my shoulders and was choking me. So it, I can't, I don't even know, I didn't know how to even process that other than to scream for my mom to help me. And I couldn't get words out. I was like. You were 21, how old were you? I was about probably 20, 21, yeah. It's, I heard an interior voice tell me to pray. 
and I was like, and then I heard an interior voice. It was, this was like in my mind. So I believe this was my guardian angel. It said, pray the Hail Mary and do it interiorly. Like it wasn't like I heard with my ears. I just understood. And so I began to pray the Hail Mary in my mind and I felt a little bit of a release. And then I was finally able to like, I felt like a, like my, my throat was being like let go of. And so I got the words out, hey, Mary. And when I got the name of Mary out, everything went totally back to normal, force went away. And that was probably one of the greatest, most greatest blessings I could have received from God because I knew for a fact that I, one, I had a problem and my problem was a spiritual problem that all of this stuff about demons and hell and all of that stuff is real. And the power of the Virgin Mary is immeasurably real because I was living in mortal sin, taking communion unworthily. I was a bad person. And I called upon her name and she helped me regardless of how wretched I was. And afterwards, because I was so confused and scared, I just went online and I was like typing in everything that had happened. And I came across a website that was immensely helpful that doesn't exist anymore, but you can find the remnants of it called the Padre Pio Center for Deliverance. And on the website they had, they listed it, they called them hooks, uh, little intrinsically bad things that the devil will use to infiltrate a person. And the hooks were pornography, artificial contraception, rated R movies, mm -hmm. all sorts of stuff. And I had most of the things on the, the checklist. We had Father Carlos Martins on the show a couple months ago. He and I are good buddies. You know actually. him, but yeah. he was talking about that. Yeah. that. It's like, well, what are the danger zones for just your everyday person yeah. that can welcome in the demonic yeah. without even intending to? And he was saying... Honestly, besides witchcraft or Wicca or whatever, that world occult stuff, it's sexual sin. Yes. And yeah. that's what we're totally swimming in in our culture. Yes. It's like sexual sin is not just something that happens. It's almost expected of people yeah. as a normal thing to do. Like you're supposed to be having sex yes. outside of marriage. That's normal. And so, of course, there's a lot of, I think, demonic oppression and 100 percent and, and now like you say that people aren't even ashamed of it and before you'd like if you looked at pornography people your friends would be like what's wrong with you but now they're like sharing it with each other and it's just not it our culture is so backwards when it comes to purity and god's plan for sex and marriage so after that incredible encounter yeah. where you experience the power of mm -hmm. it, asking for mary's help yes. when you're getting attacked by yes. a, a demon it sounds yes. like i mean it's incredible uh what did your conversion process look like to get out of that oh lifestyle and those yes. habits? Because I mean, we've, we've have talked about sexual addiction on the show and I don't know if that's something that right. you were dealing with directly, but you know, sometimes it was both, I think it was spiritual and a physical addiction. Mm -hmm. And so immediately I got rid of all of those, like that night I got rid of everything I could. And then the next day my mom went to work and I got rid of all the bad things that she had. Uh, she had a lot of new age books and Buddha statues and things that were of false gods. Um, and I just destroyed them all. And in my house, I started putting up a bunch of holy pictures and putting holy music. And I would have EWTN's audio library going, even when I wasn't home. Thank you, EWTN. Yes, I had EWTN <laughs> audio, like the lives of the saints, Mother like Angelica, the background. Bob and Penny Lord, all my computer playing nonstop. So, Did your mother know you were doing this while she was at work? Doing what? throwing away all of her stuff. She didn't know, she found out and she was not happy because I went overboard. She had a lot of elephants in the house and she just liked elephants, but I thought she had too many elephants. Oh my gosh. So I, threw them, I was like, this is superstitious. Why we got so many elephants in oh here? Oh my gosh. Yeah, so it, 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 was, was, it, was, it, was, it was it was over the top. It was over the top. I, I overreacted, but <laughs> I cleansed the house. Um, and then I went through the process of starting to pray the rosary and going to confession a lot. When, especially when I first had like this realization that I am, I'm a mess and I'm a slave to my passions and maybe even to diabolical obsessions. I, you know, so sometimes I had to go to confession like the next day, but with prayer, with receiving the sacrament of confession, it gives you the grace to overcome that slowly. You begin to sin less and less and less provided you don't quit. And I noticed that when I prayed the rosary specifically, I had a strength. I would still be tempted, but I wasn't tempted as strongly. And I began to pray sometimes three rosaries, four rosaries. I didn't have like a rule. I didn't say I'm doing this every single day. I just noticed that when I prayed more, the temptation was less. 
and I still had the habit of going to the chapel. So now as I'm going to the chapel and I'm praying the rosary, I begin to, yes, sin less, but I also begin to hear the voice of God, not like audibly where you'd say, oh, he's a mystic or something, but just like the way God speaks in the depths of your heart about what he wanted me to do with my life. I felt like he was calling to me to go into religious education, to give back, to teach middle schoolers, to teach high school religion, um, to try and maybe help other young people to avoid the pitfalls that I had fallen into. And, and this was all in college. This is all in college, yeah. So I have a question sure. about this because yeah. I and it, and I'm I'm gonna guess the people listening, there are people that they know. I mean, I think all of us know someone right. who has struggled with a sex addiction. Yes, it is everywhere. Oh people, my maybe gosh. even people listening. I would say the, I would say the it. overwhelming majority of people have a sexual addiction. It's it's yeah. crazy, right? And yeah. our culture is basically designed to give people this addiction because right. it exposes sexual, you know, porn material to kids at a young age, yep. and and then you know the whole thing happens. So and then you're in school, you know, you literally have Planned Parenthood yes. who runs school curriculum on sex and ed, sex ed, and it's basically you should masturbate. I mean, that's yes. you should uh, self abuse. You're not health. You're not healthy unless you do. Yeah. It's, so it's really dark. I am curious your thoughts on this because um, you know we're, we have we work we, like Covenant Eyes as an example yes. is one of our sponsors. Mm -hmm. So shout out to Covenant Eyes. But different ways to deal with you know sexual addiction, temptation, all of this right. stuff. But I have heard it said that these things can also be over spiritualized in the right. sense that we have to work within the natural order. And if there really is a compulsion when it comes right. to um, sexual addiction of some kind. Yes. It is not just a spiritual problem. Right. It's a sort of like, you know, psychological and physical problem. In addition, right. I don't know if you have any take on that yeah, and, I do. and it's both advice and. for people, uh, because I think some people are like, oh, I'm praying, I'm trying to pray it right. away, but I'm struggling. Yes. And, you know, we have to use natural means right. as well as the supernatural means. Right. Yeah. It's both. I, I really believe it's both and. And so when I say that the rosary gave me a strength, I believe that it was also because I was getting spiritual attacks. Mm -hmm. So I had a natural addiction because there's the dopamine and the oxytocin that comes when you have a sexual climax. Mm -hmm. So I had that and I needed to implement practical tips. But then I also believe that I was having spiritual attacks because of the things that I had opened myself up to. And for people who are struggling with impurity, I have found and this comes to just when you go to confession and you make an examination of your conscience and you look at where you fell, usually you weren't just walking and then you start looking at pornography. Usually there is a succession of little steps that lead up to it. You, you take a second glance at somebody who's dressed immodestly. Then you go on YouTube and you look up something that has, that you know is going to excite you. And then you take it to the next step and then you go and look at pornography. And what I found in addition to praying, but especially beneficial to me, was to begin to confess or to examine where I started to go astray, to how often was I looking at taking a second glance at a person. And when you start to examine that and you keep it close to your heart, uh, you, don't, you don't go as far because you're correcting yourself earlier. It's, not, it's definitely not all spiritual and it's definitely not all practical. It's a both and. It's a whole person that needs to be worked on. But Our Lady will help. I, I've found, and we can get there in a moment, but I have found, because I'm deal. i a high school youth minister, and most of my teens come to me, I would say most, uh, with no religious education whatsoever, and addictions, because they grew up in the world, and they have access uh, to pornography. And that's one of the main reasons, I think, why pornography addiction is so pre prevalent, is because if you even get tempted, you have like even in the heat of a moment, you have access to it on your phone, and nobody's going to know. It can be your little hidden thing, and you can live a duplicitous life. But I have found in young people who take up the rosary as kind of like a way of life that they they overcome it. Mm -hmm. um, they might be struggling frequently, and then slowly, after a month or two, their falling into mortal sin is less and less, into the point where they are now. Uh, evangelizing their peers and trying to help them and get them through this. As I began to pray more and hear the voice of God in prayer more, I went into Catholic education. And this was around the time where Steve Jobs was introducing the first iPhone. I love Steve Jobs. He's a very inspiring person to me, even though he lived a morally questionable life. And I began to notice in my students that as they get iPhones and there's 
social media and you know web browsers now they have access to it they don't have the tools and they weren't responding to me as a teacher as a teacher of religion they weren't praying more they weren't changing their behavior they were still some of them were bullying still i realized that i was an ineffective teacher i was failing at what i felt god was calling me to in part because of the iphone you know, just because they're, they're just corrupt kids. children. Okay. They're okay. corrupt. <laughs> okay. They're good kids in a kind of, but they were. It was you're, tough, you're saying. They were was, not listening. They were to not you. listening. And I think okay. every parent can kind of relate to that when you're trying to get your kid to like be holy and be How good. How old? These are high school These kids? These are middle schoolers. Oh, middle yeah, schoolers. I got, I got okay. a job teaching middle school. We Heart Nutrition provides wholesome supplements and vitamins, and they have wholesome values. Not only does We Heart Nutrition use the highest quality, research-backed ingredients that are always in the most bioavailable form, We Heart Nutrition is also unapologetically pro-life. In fact, 10% of every sale of their vitamins is given back to pregnancy care centers. You may not know this, but many of the major multivitamin companies are owned by corporations that donate directly to Planned Parenthood. With We Heart Nutrition, it's the opposite. It's not only a best-in-class vitamin, but they're donating 10% of their proceeds back to pro-life resource centers. We Heart Nutrition sells vitamins for women at every age and stage of life, including options for preconception, pregnancy, postpartum, and postmenopause. So go to weheartnutrition.com today. Use the code Lila for 20% at checkout. Now, when you place an order of $50 or more at weheartnutrition.com, you will receive a free signature bamboo capsule box. These boxes are adorable and make taking your vitamins or traveling with them easy. Check out weheartnutrition.com and use the code Lila at checkout for 20% off. That's weheartnutrition.com. These are high school These kids? These are middle schoolers. Oh, middle yeah, schoolers. I got, I got okay. a job teaching middle school. So what did you do? So... It was all God's providence. I had been invited on a retreat and it was to see some, this priest who was leading it was claimed to have had uh, special gifts from the Holy Spirit to read souls and to be able to just, he, he was supposed to be a very holy priest. And so I went on this retreat and he was encouraging everybody at the retreat to make a general confession which is a confession of sins of all of the grave evils that you've ever committed your entire life. He was, and, and people should know, you don't make a general confession willy-nilly or frequently. It's maybe like a once or twice in your lifetime type of thing. And the benefits of it is to see how God's mercy has penetrated your life and to be thankful for what God has done in your life. And so I made a general confession of my entire life and I was bawling and sobbing throughout it because I, at this point in my life, I was pretty good. Like I wasn't falling into mortal sin. Maybe it was like be a one-off. So I was doing really well. But to look back on my life and to see how many people that I've hurt, to see how many times I fell into sin, I just felt really guilty when I was confessing. And the priest was like, well, your penance is very light because since your last confession, you really haven't done anything too bad. But consider praying all of the mysteries of the rosary every single day for an entire year in reparation for all of the evil that you've done and all the evil that you've spread and all the people that you've led astray. You don't have to do it, but consider it. And if you do choose to do that, don't ever look back again. Say, Blessed Mother, I'm praying this time for a year for you to bring good out of all of my mistakes. I'm petitioning you to give grace to these individuals that I've hurt and then never look back. And so I, I, I accepted that offer and I began to live the rosary throughout the day. I'd pray a rosary in the morning when I woke up. I'd pray a rosary midday. I'd pray a rosary in the early afternoon and I would pray a rosary before bed. And my life dramatically changed. Okay. So yeah. I, there's a lot I have to ask yeah, about please, this, especially please. because a lot of folks who listen to the show are not Catholic. Right. This, so yeah. we get into Catholic yes. stuff and thank you for those yeah. that are patient. Thank with, you for your patience. Patient when I do this on this show, we talk about a lot of things, but of course you guys know I'm Catholic and I'm very passionate and you're yes. obviously very passionate about your Catholic faith. Um, and it's just about God. We, yes, we yes, all, yes. I think everyone yeah. who listens to this show is seeking God. Yeah, seeking so, God. uh, what is the rosary? Sure. And you mentioned you pray four rosaries. Right. Are you still doing this? Oh yeah. I'm praying a little bit more than that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. We, we, yeah. This is a full-time rosary prayer. Um, and we, we, yeah. It, it's kind of a little bit longer story, but yes, I, the rosary, I have been convinced, thoroughly convinced that it is theologically the most profound spiritual prayer for any Christian, not just for a Catholic, that 
exists. And I pray it not because it's a pious thing anymore. I pray it because I don't know of a better prayer that exists and I cannot come up with one. For those who are not familiar, or maybe they've heard, obviously, the right. rosary. Everyone's heard of a right. rosary. But what is the rosary composed right. of? So I like to joke that the first ingredient of the rosary is death because it does require a certain like, like there's like, I'll be honest, there's very few times where I really want to pray it. I know that I need to, I can notice in myself that I'm getting edgy or antsy. So the first component of praying the rosary is a certain self-denial that Christ asks of us. Um, one of the secrets to holiness, as an aside, one of the secrets to holiness and the secrets to happiness is doing God's will for your life discerning what God is calling you to do and doing it. That is the essence of holiness, to be united to Christ. But so often Christians don't do God's will because they don't want to or because they have they don't know what God's will is. They haven't asked God. And so what the rosary at the very onset forces you to do is stop doing what you want to do and be attentive to the voice of God, which is like the very first ingredient is the choice to pray. Then the prayers, the vocal prayers of the rosary, the Our Father, the Hail Mary, it's kind of like stirring up a whirlwind of the Holy Spirit by praying the prayer that the Lord taught, by saying the Hail Mary. I know a lot of our Protestant brothers and sisters don't like that idea of praying the Hail Mary, but if you think about it objectively, those are the most sacred words in the history of humanity. It is at the invocation of the angel Gabriel when he says to the Virgin Mary, Hail, full of grace. It is that moment that all of salvation history changes. Where Mary says, thy will be done, let it be done to me according to thy word. The Holy Spirit comes upon her, fills her, the second person of the Holy Trinity takes on flesh, and God enters the world and hope enters humanity. Those words always call down the power of the Holy Spirit. Those words always tug on the heart of God the Father. Those words always get the attention of every angel. Those The angels have been, have been waiting since the fall of Adam and Eve for those words to be proclaimed. So it sounds like it's very Marian, and it is, but it's Christocentric. And so when you say those words, and the Our Fathers, that isn't the rosary. The heart of the rosary is spending time with Christ in the mysteries of his life. So I, I'll have my rosary beads out just because I always carry them. And this is kind of like a tour of the life of Christ. And many people don't pray the rosary well. We use the word meditate on the mysteries. In my research through the various doctors of the church, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, St. Alphonsus of Wari, St. Francis de Sales, they will use the word mental prayer and meditation interchangeably within a couple of sentences of one another. And so what they mean when they're saying, let, let, and what I, I believe Our Lady meant when she revealed this to St. Dominic to meditate upon the mystery is to, one, make an act of faith that God is present. This is, these are the steps of mental prayer. Make an act of faith, God, I believe you're present. I believe you're close to me. You're holding me into existence. I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit. Two, imagine to the best of your ability, the scene, let's say for example, we're imagining the birth of the child Jesus in Bethlehem. So I would imagine a fat baby Jesus, just the chubbiest, cutest little person. And imagine as if you're holding him or that you're there, you're a part of the scene. But the most important part of mental prayer or meditation is to speak to Christ in that scene. So for example, let's say you have a financial difficulty. You're praying the third joyful mystery of the rosary. You're holding the fat baby Jesus how long should I think about fat baby Jesus? The saints say, until it makes an impression on you. And it can be any, any aspect of fat child. So just looking at fat feet, you know, fat baby feet that look like a loaf of bread. Like you could just think of that. And when that makes an impression, you're like, oh, God became a man and had fat baby loaf feet. Now I can begin my conversation with Christ and just say, Lord, I need money. <laughs> You're a baby. You have no concept of money. Can I have some money? And then the, so the first step of prayer is recollection, act of faith in the presence of God. The second step of prayer is consideration or meditation. The third step is conversation. But the conversation doesn't end when I tell baby Jesus I need money. I have to pause for a moment and allow the Lord to move in my heart. 
And that's different for different people. But I would, I've had this happen to me before where I'm praying to fat baby Jesus, Lord, I need money. And then I look into his beautiful brown eyes. I'm imagining them. Of course, I don't know what his eyes look like, but I'm imagining it. And I sense him in the stirrings of my heart say, you're holding me and I trust you to hold me. Do you trust me to hold you? Mm. And yes, it's my imagination, but something happens in the depths of my soul that changes me and God communicates through movements of the soul, through what we call consolations. So that process, once you know it, uh, recollection, consideration, conversation, once you practice it and you practice it very well in the rosary, it takes about 30 seconds. And when you start to pray the rosary like that, when you're having an encounter with the person of Christ and all the various aspects of his life, mixed with the Our Father, mixed with the prayer, the Hail Mary, which was the beginning of the end of Satan because Christ became word incarnate on this earth. That To me, that's scientific. Like, does a prayer that has all of those elements exist? Like, I don't know one where I'm in the presence of Christ stirring up a whirlwind of the Holy Spirit around me. Like, it's... So I love so much of what you're saying. There's so much to unpack here. Yeah. I mean, starting mm -hmm. with what you were saying. I mean, there's the Our Father yeah. at the beginning of each of the decades, the yes. five decades of the of mm -hmm. the rosary. And then you have the 10 Hail Marys and then you have the Glory Be. But starting with the Our Father, this is the perfect prayer, right? Jesus literally tells us, yes. this is how you pray, how everybody. Pray. So like it. to pray the Our Father, not just yeah. once a day, but throughout the day, this is the prayer that God himself gave us. Yes. There's one prayer, it's this prayer. And then you were saying about the the greeting of the angel yes. to Mary. And I love what you're saying about the Holy Spirit. He's he's coming upon Mary. This is how Jesus Christ comes into the world incredibly. And I can you just I guess it's like sense for a moment like what would what was that room like, that room when Mary received this message and she said yes to the angel, yes to God, to be the mother of God, the mother of Jesus. Like the intensity of the experience of the Holy Spirit in that room. Like the, the it, it was just I can't even, it was mind blowing, but of course Mary had that experience. And so we're, we're asking to share in. Yes. We're asking to share in the incarnation. Yes. Really. I mean, that's what you're saying because, Give me goosebumps. because the whole, you know, the rosary, it's the life of Christ, all the scenes of his life, all of the different mysteries. And so you're asking to be there with him in his life yeah. and then his death, his passion, his death, and then his resurrection his yes. into eternity. And what is the who who is the Christian that doesn't do that? Right. Like, how do we do Christianity right. without entering into the life of Christ? Yeah. I mean, right. I mean, we, yeah, we can't. To me, right. It's like it's pretty incredible. Like, it sounds great. <laughs> if, as long yeah. as people don't see it as that's something that Catholics do. Like, no, it's a good prayer for all Christians. I mean, it's the gospels. Yeah, it's the gospels. It's the gospel. The the, the rosary is the gospels. Yeah, and. I often would ponder, because you know they say Mary pondered all these things in her heart. I would ponder, what did she ponder the most? And I would think to myself, mm -hmm. maybe it was the Eucharist, maybe it was the crucifixion. Mm -hmm. But then as I was praying the rosary, it dawned on me, she pondered the incarnation the most. Because without God becoming man, he can't be crucified. Without God becoming man, we can't receive him in Holy Communion. When she looked at him when he was sucking on her breast, she thought to herself, God became man and I am nursing him. God became man and he is playing outside right now. God became man and he's hanging on the cross. Like So to, for people who might feel like it's a lot of Hail Marys. Yeah, and if you're uncomfortable saying the Hail Mary, you can just say the first half of it. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. If you feel uncomfortable saying, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now. like. Just say the first part if yeah, you're just, Protestant. Yeah, if you're uncomfortable well, with it. But the other thing is like the all generations will call me blessed. Yeah, it's I beautiful. I mean, that that like Mary predicts that yes. all generations will call me blessed. If not for the rosary, practically, what does that even mean? Right. How Ooh, would that prediction have made insight. sense? Great insight. Great insight. Because that's that. what we do. We say, yeah. Hail Mary, full of grace. We're calling yeah. her blessed with every bead we pray. And I have a lot of Protestant friends and I, like from when, whenever they lose a loved one, they will tell me things like, I know my grandfather's watching over me in heaven. Like I know he's, I know he's by my side. He's like my angel. And I don't, I don't correct them. It's like, well, he's like, he's actually like your saint. But so there is a deep down belief that their loved one is alive in Christ, that they have, if they're watching over you, what does that mean? They're protecting you somehow. They're interceding for you. So I don't think that there's a disconnect. I think that it's maybe might be like a 
our team doesn't do that sometimes uh, kind of like attitude. But I think that if you just look at it from an unbiased perspective, it's pretty great. Like, so you mentioned Mary giving this to St. Dominic. Yes. Yes. What, can you share about what happened? Because yes. even the idea of this, like, you want right. to hold it up for us again? Yes, please. Yeah. My weapon. <laughs> Should the Lila Rose podcast have a special rosary that we Ooh, have in the shop? We're going to launch I a shop soon. I love that. But that's, that is well, like a hardcore rosary right there. You've got, you've got right good there. taste and style. So, so I'm sure the Lila Rose, Lila Rose we'll rosary will be We'll see it have roses on it, of course. But, I love it. But you, if you don't mind sure, holding please, up. So yes. you've got the crucifix with, yeah. this is where you do the creed, right? And then the yeah. Our Father, yeah. Hail Marys. And then there's the five decades. And mine Our is Father. covered in little medallions of my <laughs> of favorite <course>. saints. <laughs> I love the zeal you gave. It's amazing. But um, so this idea of having these beads yes. strung on rope, right? right. Or whatever. Can, can you tell us the history of yeah. what how this originated? Sure. Covenant Eyes helps men and women achieve victory over porn addiction by blocking explicit websites and helping you connect with your accountability partner. This is such a beautiful approach to ensuring that people can have victory over porn addiction. Covenant Eyes has a special program called Arise, which is a 21-day video series specifically designed to help Christian women overcome sexual addiction. Arise helps you identify the wounds at the root of sexual addiction. This is a safe and confidential community for support. You can get 30 days of Covenant Eyes for free by going to the link in the description and using the code LILA at checkout. So originally there were, and and many religions have beads on ropes to keep track of various prayers that people pray. And so prior to the introduction of the rosary by the Blessed Mother to St. Dominic, there was a kind of a rosary because religious would pray the Liturgy of the Hours, which is the Psalms, 150 of them throughout the day. Lay people at this time couldn't read so that they didn't know the Psalms. And so they would pray Our Fathers, Hail Marys, or other prayers depending on which region they were from. So they would pray the Hail Mary before the introduction of the Rosary. Right, yeah, some, some would pray 150 of them. So we would- and, But was it, did it include pray for us now in the hour of our death or just the first so part of the, the first part the of The first part, the angel's greeting was up until Pope Pius V during the Battle of Lepanto and the Council of Trent, he added the second half of the Hail Mary. So well after the introduction of the Rosary, to St. Dominic, because I think that was like in the 13th century. It was into the 16th century that we started praying the Holy Mary, Mother of God, mm. pray for us now and at the hour of our death. So that was like the later add-on. That was after the Battle of Lepanto. Uh, or around that time. Okay. Yeah, it was around that time. Definitely introduced by Pius V. So maybe before. Do you know why he did that? I have no idea. Putting but you on the spot. <laughs> I, think, I think it's a pretty good idea though. <laughs> it's actually pretty, ge out, it's pretty genius because you're asking Mary to pray for you now and at the hour of your death. So if you prayed 50 Hail Marys today and tomorrow and tomorrow for 365 days times 50 years of your life, when you die, you're going to have hundreds of thousands of Hail Marys coming to you at the hour of your death, which is a very <laughs> you know important moment. And so like Our Lady is just going to be like, present, like just raining down graces upon you from a lifetime of prayers. So it's a pretty brilliant addition. Yeah, I can't, other than it's being brilliant, I can't think of anything else. He doubled the length of it. So moderns, sometimes moderns who are very trad and they're against new things, um, they will be against the luminous mysteries and against mm -hmm. Pope John Paul II. And they will say things like, how dare Pope John Paul II? That's so prideful to add to whatever the Mary gave. That's perfect. But by that same logic, we shouldn't be praying the second half of the Hail Mary because when Mary gave the rosary to St. Dominic, it was just the first half of the Hail Mary. It was not. This is so inside baseball for Go people, ahead, but please. no, I know, no, what you're saying is yeah. it's great. It's fun. But St. John Paul II, yes. our Pope, oh, he, yes, he, so he gave us the luminous, yes. luminous mysteries. He right. introduced them for the church, yes. which is certain parts of Jesus's right. ministry, yes. like his ministerial ministry, life, his yeah. public ministry life. When the other mysteries and the other rosaries, because mm -hmm. there's four, yep. right? You have the joint, look, the give joyful. them to us. Yeah, what so, are the, the, so originally introduced by the Virgin Mary or that she requested of St. Dominic were the joyful mysteries which covered the annunciation through jesus's childhood and it ends with so when the angel gabriel is announcing jesus christ to mary and, the and she conceives yeah. jesus that's the beginning of the first rosary yeah and then the there's five mysteries that you can pray that we call them the joyful and it ends with finding the child jesus after he was lost in the temple then in the original rosary it would go to the sorrowful mysteries which is the passion of Jesus. And then it would go into the glorious mysteries, which involved the resurrection, ascension, descent of the Holy Spirit. So there was a major gap in the life of Christ. And one of the genius parts of the rosary is that 
my children at the age of 10, because we prayed the rosary every day as a family, knew more about the life of Christ than many adults because they prayed the rosary. They, got, they covered Jesus from his childhood all the way to his adulthood. John Paul II adding those luminous mysteries, those public ministry days, actually did something, again, theologically profound because the baptism of Jesus, the wedding feast the of Cana, Jordan. St. John the Baptist, the proclamation of the kingdom, the transfiguration and the institution of the Eucharist are all things that are under attack right now in the church. And so by meditating upon those mysteries, there's a saying in theology, a grace remembered is a grace renewed. Mm -hmm. So by meditating on baptism, meditating on the sacrament of holy matrimony, meditating on the importance of preaching, meditating on the divinity of Christ, meditating on the institution of the Eucharist and the priesthood, what he's doing in prayer is renewing all of those aspects of the church. What's so um, powerful about what you're saying, Gabe, it's so good. And it's also very convicting even for me because I think about when I pray the rosary, we pray a decade each night yes, with our very, very young children. Very, very good. I mean, yes. it would be great if we did the whole thing, but we get yes. through a decade with our very young kids. Yes. But just the importance of connecting it to a mystery. Yes. Because I think in my, I'll just share my own life of praying the rosary. And I know I've observed in many people's, it's part of a habit, which can be very beautiful and yes. good. But then you're like, okay, this, what's mystery is it? Oh yeah. The, you know, the agony of the garden. Okay. Okay. And then the Hail Mary Fall of the Rosary saying, you're like, you know, you do your thing, mm -hmm. but you're not, are you t putting the, taking the, the movement of the heart and the mind to move to, okay, what am I actually doing here? Right. Who am I with here? What's right. happening here? And it's so easy to make it a routine. And again, yes. the Lord blesses even the yes. smallest movement of our heart. And right. even if we do one little thing, Great. God will use Insight. it. Yeah. And maybe we're exhausted or our brain is fried and that's okay. Just like the, you're, you're there with Mary, you're there with right. Jesus. So let that be enough. But we have so many opportunities, like you're saying, to say, okay, what am I, am I really in the garden watching Jesus? Mm -hmm. Sweat yes. blood for me. This is for me. He's I doing this. Oh my gosh! Yes. You know, like and and yeah. but like let yourself experience. Be there with him. Be there with him, but also let yourself be loved by him. Yes. Like he's doing this for you. Yes. This is a tremendous amount of suffering he's enduring for us. Mm -hmm. Do we know? Do we let ourselves feel how loved we are that someone would do this for us? Oh my gosh! You know, yeah. we don't even it. think about it. We just go and do our lives, right? And so, but what you're saying is so beautiful to really make that the practice of the rosary, not just to say the words but mm -hmm. to mentally pray the words to the best of your ability to the yeah. best of your ability tell it talk, talk to me more about the mental prayer because so, you were saying it's yeah. synonymous with meditation and right. many of the writings of the lives of the saints i'm sorry gabe there's one more thing i meant no, to please, ask you to do no, I'm, I'm moving you too many places saint dominic yes our lady giving saint dominic the rosary right. just give us that scene I'll what you, happened I'll give with you the that story, brief okay. version so saint dominic was a great preacher i i kind of imagine him like a mixture of bishop baron with Fulton Sheen, just like the guy you want to hear, like he just, he, he always delivers, but he wasn't being fruitful. And so that really bothered him because he was trying to convert a, a group called the Albigensians and he was not effective. Where, and where was this? This is in France. Wow. So he offered himself to Our Lady as we, we would call it a victim soul. I don't think he was thinking about that. He was just begging Blessed Mother, help me. I want to be able to reach hardened sinners. I, I want to call down the power of the Holy Spirit like Jesus promised that we'd have streams of living water flowing through us. I want all of that. So he was preaching in Fran in like now France, yeah. modern day France, and he, what, what year, what, roughly what year um, was this? 12th, 13th century, early 1200s. Okay, so yeah. he's at 1200s. He's there to convert people. And he's a really good, talented preacher, it sounds like, but he's having trouble with right. fruitfulness. He's like, yeah. people are not converting. Yeah. What am I doing wrong here? And so he does literally Hail Mary. I mean, he's like, Mary, help me out. That's yeah, he, kind he of the whole thing. He begs Mary for help. He fasts. He takes the discipline, which isn't a popular thing anymore. It's like doing penance uh, until the point that he faints. And the Virgin Mary appears to him and says to him, Dominic, my well-beloved son, because you have been so faithful, our Lord is going to answer your prayer. And this is going to be a prayer that calls down the power of the Holy Spirit that reaches the heart of hardened sinners. And everywhere you promote this rosary, you're going to be fruitful. And these are her exact words that I'm going to quote to you because they're very profound. She said, in this type of warfare, the battering ram has been and always will be the angelic salutation, which is the cornerstone of the New Testament. That's very profound wow. because Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. And often, I used to think at least, 
that that meant that we're going to put up boundaries and we're going to keep hell out and it's going to be a small remnant. But that wasn't Jesus's intention. Jesus's intention was the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. Wherever there's hell in your family, wherever there's hell in your community or at work, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you're going to go in there and you're going to bring the light of Christ. And so how do you bring the light of Christ into a community that does not want Christ? The same way Jesus did. Hail Mary, full of grace. It is those words that broke down the walls of the kingdom of Satan here on earth. And those words were fruitful then, and they're going to be fruitful today, and they'll be fruitful tomorrow. So in this type of warfare, the battering ram is the angelic salutation. Imagine well, and it just took Mary's yes, right? Yeah. Like Mary's yes to the angel, to yeah, God, yeah. brought Jesus. And then by his, by his, through him and through her yes, we are saved. But yeah. you're saying when we say our yes to yes, say, the, yes. to echo the words and to ask Mary to help us and bring Jesus into wherever we are, we can be con conquerors yes. it, it, to it, Satan wherever we go, so, even in our own family. It's so powerful because when you it's start good. to say those words, you will get inspirations. So you go in to pray the rosary with a conflict. You're praying because your husband or your wife is really, you know what, she's really getting on my nerves today. I'm trying to do what she wants me to do. And then she asked me to do something else and you're stressed and you're praying Jesus carrying of the cross, and you're saying, Our Father who art in heaven, Hail Mary, full of grace, Hail Mary, full of grace, Hail Mary, full of grace. And while you're thinking of Jesus carrying the cross, he looks at you in a certain way and it hits you. What is Jesus doing? Patiently carrying his cross. He's patiently loving. And you are strengthened to patiently love. And when you unite your will to the will of God, the power of the Holy Spirit flows out of you, and relationships are healed and marriages are made stronger and families are empowered. And so you so was, nailed it. You was St. Dominic fruitful after this? Oh my gosh. Oh, he was so fruitful. Oh, who did, who did he convert? He converted everybody. He, in the book, The Secret of the Rosary by St. Louis de Montfort, there's a great testimony. He says, everywhere that Dominic preached the rosary, hardened sinners were converted, miracles happened, even young children were doing extreme penances. And Throughout the history of the church, wherever the rosary was preached, sin died down. Not just said, but preached. Preached. What's that, the that's distinction? the key. Preached. What that's does that the key. mean? It's what we're the... not doing. Preach means promoting it. And the best way to promote it, if people are listening and they're like, well, I, where am I going to promote it? I'm not like a catechist teacher or anything like that. I don't have a podcast. The best time to promote it is anytime somebody's suffering. So St. John of the Cross said that suffering endears men to Christ. So when a person in your family is suffering, give them a rosary, say, or even say, I bought this for you. Let me pray with you. And because they're vulnerable, they're open. They're mm -hmm. open. When people are suffering, we're willing to try anything to make it stop. And that is the perfect time for the grace of God to bring peace Maybe they're, they don't get the job or maybe they don't get physically healed. But one of the fruits of the rosary, because the rosary is inspired by the word of God, what does the word of God say about the fruits of the spirit? The fruits of the spirit are peace, one of them. And so you pray the rosary with somebody who's suffering, they will have peace. I, or even just you tell them you're praying for them yes. and you give them a rosary. Oh, that that, gosh, that yes. works too. Oh, yes. So can you tell me about the Battle of Lepanto? I'm putting yes. it on the spot here, sure. but we haven't actually talked about it yet on the show. Okay, great. And I think that's a really great like yes. historical record yes. proof. Like yes. it's really really yes. just shows the proof of prayer, yes. the yes. power of prayer in human history, but specifically the rosary. Yes. So the Turks, the Ottoman Empire, the Muslims were invading and the Christian fleets, it was a, a naval battle near Greece. The Christian fleets were vastly outnumbered. And the Pope called upon everybody universally, pray the rosary, pray the rosary, pray the rosary, pray the rosary. He was just doing everything That was like possible. a letter he wrote Christendom because obviously there's yes. no like he was just, social media he or was, phones. To... Yeah, he was a rosary warrior promoting it. So everyone knew the Ottoman <clears throat> Turks are coming. Yes. They're more powerful than we are. They're going to basically, what, pillage us? Yes, and this Conquer is the last and stand. You and I, I would be named, if I was alive, I would be named Muhammad right now because all of Western civilization would have crumbled. This was like a major, major battle. So they were Muslim. Yeah, they were Muslim. Yeah. So I mean, a lot of people don't know the history here. Right. So it's just, But it's fascinating, right. right? So this is, and you're saying if they had overtaken the... Christians, they would have not stopped there. They would have oh, gone further. Sure. Is yes. it further this was like the last stand. Yes. Further south into Europe. Yes. And this, thy... this was something that all historians agree upon, that this battle was decisive. 
And in the middle of the battle, the winds started to change and ended up supporting the Christian armies. And the Christian armies, although vastly outnumbered, totally destroyed it. But they were all praying the rosary during this? No, the, peop the people of God were praying the rosary. So so, so all, everyone's praying the rosary and you're saying all of a sudden, as they're, are, as they, they're are they actively praying the rosary while they're battle no, or no, no, all no. their family the, the, is the, praying the rosary? The, the, People who are not at war are praying the rosary. They're for yeah. them, but this yeah, was everyone yeah. agreed. This is our this yes. is our plan. We're, all, yeah, we're just going to pray. Is, we're going in. Yes. What else can we do? They there? even had uh, an image of Our Lady of Guadalupe as like as their standard. So Our Lady was very very prominent, very prominent, and it was a very decisive victory. But and and sometimes I get upset with the church because we talk about the Battle of Lepanto, and it's like why do we always refer to the Battle of Lepanto? Because it's very famous. Because afterwards. Uh, Pope Pius V named October 7th to be the Feast of Our Lady of Victory. And October 7th today is known as Our Lady of the Rosary. So there is a synonymous tie there that in the rosary, you will have victory. My friend, Padre Pio, I, mean, I don't really know him, but I pray to him a lot, so we're buddies. He said that the rosary is the prayer for those who are victorious over everyone and over everything. And we haven't won in a long time as Catholics. Our last major battle was the Battle of Lepanto. Like our physical battle. Yeah, our spiritual battle. Like It feels like the Catholic Church is irrelevant. You think so? Oh, I, I think so. I think that people ask me, they say... You mean in like human affairs? In human affairs. Like, like yeah, people like... The, the, a priest goes into... One of my, my pastors, he wears the cassock. He goes to the store. People think he's cosplaying. The Catholic Church used to be the number one biggest influencer in the entire world. Now we're kind of like an like afterthought. Like the patron of the arts, the patron of yeah, the Yeah, we used to be the, the best of everything. They, yeah. would, they would literally knight the, yeah. the point, the king. I mean, it's in interesting. I, I mean, I'm a little more hopeful maybe no, that I, there's a lot a lot of good we're happening. We're doing good, but and, we're and not winning. Well, it depends what we mean. What do, you, yeah. what do you mean, right? I mean, we're the battle for souls that happens on a daily basis. You think we're losing? E e even at a good parish that's thriving and flourishing, mm -hmm. there are more Catholics out of the church than are mm -hmm. in the church. Meaning these are Catholics, they are baptized Catholics. Right, yeah. We and they're, a... not, they're not living their Catholic faith. Oh, for sure, yeah. yeah. Well, no, and the number of people even listening to this show right now, if you're still right. listening, thanks for continuing to listen. If you are not Catholic, they were maybe raised Catholic and they right. become evangelical right. because being raised Catholic, they felt they never had an encounter with Jesus. Right. I How think heartbreaking, there, I think right? there is a resurgence in Catholic circles, getting more faithful, getting stronger, mm -hmm. learning their faith. I think more Catholics now than ever before know their faith. We're, like, there's no shortage of apologetics and information out there. I think that the number of those actively engaged is way smaller. And I feel it on a daily basis when I work with my high school teens. And they come and I have, they've, they don't know anything. They don't know anything. And I'm like, well, did you make your first communion? Yeah, we made our first communion, we were baptized, yeah. That reminds me when I was the confirmation sponsor for a very sweet, mm -hmm. dear, beloved person in my life, a young woman. She was at the time, I don't know, you know, I don't know, what is it, yeah. 15, 14 yeah, years 50, old yeah, when depends, you make your yeah. first confirmation. Yeah. This was over a decade ago. Yeah. And I flew to her to be her confirmation mm -hmm. sponsor. And I remember meeting with her and her other class. And this is, you know, in the West Coast. And there I was like, well, are, you, are you guys excited to be, you know, being confirmed? You yeah. know, you're going to have the power to be martyrs. Like the this, this Holy Spirit is going to give you this incredible inspiration, like whatever. And they're all just like, oh, we're like whatever. We're just doing this because our parents are telling us to do this. And I was like, well, do you always want to pray together? You know, I don't know why we have this special time. We were just waiting. I love, maybe for I love that time. And, yeah, I was just trying to like, and they were like, okay, yeah, sure. We, let's all pray. And I was like, how about we pray like, the rosary or something, you know, it's like, and, and there was like, or we, and maybe it's too long. Let's do a decade. They didn't know how to pray Oof. a Hail Mary. Wow. No way. They didn't know that. No they didn't way. know how to pray a Hail Mary. That's tough. And, but, but it's like, this is the catechesis today in yeah, a lot of tough. the Western no, church. Right. That's tough. We're not even telling them what the rosary means and how to pray it among many other things. Right. On faith and morals. There is there is a resurgence though. Like I've I've heard from a lot of catechists, a lot of people involved in faith formation. Those who are in the know are stronger than ever. But I think now our strategy has to be how can we reach people outside of our bubble? Uh, yeah, that's that's the challenge. One thing I have to say here yes. for folks listening is that you mentioned Our Lady of Victory and Our Lady of yes. the Rosary yes. on October seventh. Yes, yes. 
as everyone knows, there's the election happening in early Ooh. November. Yes. Uh, there's a lot of attention on the federal election, but honestly, I don't think that is that's important. But yes. there's a lot going on there that's com conflicting and confusing, and we're not going to talk about that right now. What I will say though is, in the state, in a few states, including the states of Florida and Missouri, they have these ballot initiatives which would put abortion in the state constitution up until birth. These are states that have a lot of yes. pro-life laws as it stands, and it's really a it's a it's a get out the vote game. Like, are people going to show up and vote no in Missouri on Amendment Three and no in Florida on Amendment Four? You got to vote no because the amendments would put abortion in the state constitution. Literally, tens of thousands, potentially hundreds, and even millions of future lives are at risk because of these specific ballot initiatives. So, the pro-life movement lost a bunch of these in the last two years since Roe fell. So, if you're listening, pray the Rosary. Yes or just pray however you can, but the rosary particularly yes. for victory. Yes, this is why I really, victory. I really like you and I really like your podcast because you talk about doing practical things mm -hmm. to win. Sometimes our faith can be overly spiritualized, but if it's not practical, if it's not lived, like what are we doing? What are we doing? Like, what are we it's doing? Like so not thank incarnate. you so much for bringing that up. Right? Yes, it has to. And that's the, the word back has to, the rosary. to become flesh. Yeah, we yes. have to live what we believe. I love it. Yeah. And like make that, sometimes that's going to look a little countercultural or it's going to be a little bit risky yes. how we live it. So, and it's, we I'll also just share, we launched, we have live action. Yes. We actually just launched live action victory. And oh, I didn't actually, I didn't oh, actually think about the connection I love it. I love of it. that, but I love it. I'm going to right now just ask the Blessed Mother to give particular help in those efforts for victory because we need wins yes and we need particularly to win for the sake of these lives yes the the, the challenge i'll just say one other thing the challenge in the pro-life movement always is that our lives are not on the line right that's right our lives are not on the line right and and you look at other movements like you know people who are for gun rights or right. they're for you know economic things or you know they care about the economy or you know they're for freedom of speech right, right. all of these important things right yeah. those things they have like skin in the game, like, well, I want yes. my gun or they yeah. want their freedom of yeah. speech or they want exactly. to be able to pay for their gas, right? So people are like engaged, yes. they're zoned in. But when it comes to pro-life, like you have to have an, a level of um, detachment from what you care about in your given day to care right. about people that you're never gonna meet potentially who don't know you and have a sense of radical concern for their lives to the point of doing something to mess up your daily life for their yes, sakes. Yes, I love it. So. Yes. And praying, I think that people of prayer, when they go to pray, they are confronted with God and the voice of God speaks to them and he's the one who convicts us to act, especially in pro-life causes, because we're not, we don't have skin in the game. But when he touches our heart, we he just has a way of convicting us that we feel guilty if we don't do his will. And 100%, we have to pray for these. This is a spiritual battle. You, you've talked about it many times, the sacrifice of human children. It's a, it's a moral evil and it's a moral evil that it attracts bad spirits mm -hmm. and they want abortion more than you could ever dream of. I, I would hope, can we give a couple of tips for those people who want to try the rosary yes. out for a couple of days? Perfect. So one of my tips that I have is that I always carry a rosary with me. So some people will make the resolution, like I'm going to try to pray the rosary every day but you're more likely to keep a resolution if you actually have a physical rosary on your person. Rosaries can be expensive and there can be some cheap ones that if you can't afford one, you can get like a plastic one. There's at your local church, they have some, but I encourage people to spend money on a rosary, spend $50, $45 to buy a nice rosary uh, that's durable, that you're not just gonna leave it anywhere. You're like, you're gonna know where your rosary is, kind of like I know where my phone is. So that's yeah. We spend a thousand dollars on our phones on a phone. Yeah. So it's like get a nice rosary. Get a nice rosary. So that's tip number one. Tip number two is have an intention. So we're willing to do any what if I have a strong why. So what is it that I care about, or who is it that I love? That at the end of the day, when I'm tired and I haven't prayed. I'm going to get on my knees or I'm going to sit up straight and I'm going to pray this rosary because my mom is sick or because I have a brother who's an alcoholic and he's struggling and his family needs him. So you find a why that will motivate you to pray for nine days. So try to make it a novena. Just try to go nine days. And what will happen is that you will begin to notice the difference after nine days of prayer the peace that comes day 10, let's say you don't do it. You're gonna be like, man, I'm off today. 
I need to get that rosary back in my life. It's making a huge difference in my life. So tip number one, carry rosary. Tip number two, have an intention. Tip number three is don't be scrupulous. A lot of times the devil will discourage us. We'll hear a little voice in our head saying, you're not good at that. It's not fruitful. It's not for you. You're not one of those people. Just do your best to get it done. I have found that on days where my mind is foggy, yesterday was one of those days where I was just like, where am I going? What am I doing? When I get my prayers done and I say them, I still receive the grace. It, our, our prayer life isn't about feelings. It's about I'm praying because I love God and I'm trying. And sometimes my best ain't pretty. And this is what I have, Lord. This is what I'm presenting to you today. I'm not saying do it badly, but as you mentioned earlier, the ingredients of the rosary are so powerful that even when I pray it poorly, the words of sacred scripture, they do something. They plant seeds in my heart that actually grow to fruition. So don't be too hard on yourself. Don't be scrupulous. Tip number four, it's, if you're trying to, if you have like a real, like let's say for example, it's election day and you're like, this, there's so much on the line. I just want to be in prayer all day. I often to pray prayers, rosaries nonstop. If maybe somebody's called to do that, everybody's different. I don't want anybody ever to feel like I'm not holy or I'm not good enough. Everybody's called to a different stage of prayer in their life. And the best way to discern that is just to ask God, God, what do you want from me? Look at my life. When should I pray? But if you're going to pray more than one, you only need to do the Apostles' Creed and those, the Our Father and the Three Hail Marys, I call them the jump on prayers. You only need to do the jump on prayers once. Shortcut. Yeah, you can just, you get on the track <laughs> and you can just keep making the loops of the various mysteries. There's not a strict rule that you have to do the joyful and then the luminous and then the sorrowful and then the glorious. For some people, you might do four glorious or just, it's not, there's not like a set defined rule. As long as it has the life of Christ, our Father's 10 Hail Marys, you got the rosary. And then the final tip is make, make a plan. Things that are important to us, we put them on the calendar. We say, I've got a doctor's appointment at three. I can't miss it. Similarly, I pray every morning right when I wake up. I, I pray on my way home from work. Find a time where you're always going to pray, provided there's not like an emergency circumstance, of course. But find a time and make a plan. I, I have found in my own life and in my friends that those people who wait to the very end of the night to pray the rosary and they're laying down in bed with the rosary, like these beads are like my sleeping pills. I start praying these beads when I'm horizontal. What happens is I fall asleep. I heard it said that the guardian angel finishes for you. <laughs> uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> Have you heard that one? I've heard it, but I'm not sure if it's true or not. Or else I'll just be like, Hail Mary, good night. <laughs> uh, make a plan. Hey, one Hail Mary is better than none, right? Oh, that's right, Gabe? 100%. Oh, yes. If you, if you want to start really yes. simple, just at, when as soon as you wake up, Sit yes. up and say Hail Mary. Yes. You could, do, you could start yes. that. Yes. My favorite, one of my favorite quotes from G.K. Chester, and he said, if something is worth doing, it's worth doing mm. poorly. Mm, like, good. just get it done. Do something. Good. Something is better than nothing. But I would recommend making a plan. And that's the key to success. For people who want to pray with their children, my least objectively from what my observations are, my prayers with my family, I feel like are the least nourishing for me because like we've got a lot of moving parts i have a three-year-old i have a seven-year-old i have uh, it's it's chaos the moms listening right now gabe are like tell me about it it's chaos tell me about it there's gabe. no <laughs> there's no silver bullet to getting your children to pray well mm -hmm. again don't be overly scrupulous about it something is better than nothing one thing that worked when my children were younger is by telling them the story of the mystery I would just tell them the story of Jesus's agony in the garden. It wouldn't be necessarily scripturally accurate all the time. I'll just give them my version of the gospel. Child appropriate. And my children, they love that part. They're like, tell us a story about Jesus again. I'm like, all right, here we go. And then That's I'll tell good. you, I'll tell you the next part of the story, but it's going to cost. And then, more you, Hail then you tell them, hey, when when we pray the Hail Marys, now you can think about the story. Yes, I love yes, that. Yes, That's so yes, good. yes, yes. So that works, but there's no silver bullet. I wish mm -hmm. there was. I wish it was easy. But I have found in families that pray with their children, even if they pray a decade or they pray the full rosary, I have found that because I work with them, the, the kids, that the kids in my youth group, they're good. Like they're they're going to be okay. Mm. Uh, I, I say, hey, you guys pray as a family? You're a really good kid. You're really paying attention. I say, yeah, we pray. I'm like, what do you guys pray? Well, we pray a decade of the rosary. We pray the rosary as a family. Mm. They're good. They're really good kids. And the beauty what a of consolation. It, the beauty, yeah, the beauty is that 
we don't know what our kids are going to do when they leave the house, but because of Pius V adding that pray for me now and at the hour of my death, mm -hmm. when a child says that prayer and they leave the house, and even if it looks like they've forgotten about the Virgin Mary, mm -hmm. the Virgin Mary doesn't forget her children. Mm -hmm. And she always works her way back into their lives. I've seen it time and time again where people who have had a devotion to the rosary as a family when they were younger, they maybe fall away, they end up coming back. This, I just have to share something. This, this inspires me, what you're just saying. I just, and I'm sure she'd be comfortable with me sharing this. She, she shares it. But so in my family, mm -hmm. you know, I became Catholic in uh, college. My mother was raised Catholic, but it was like a cultural thing. Mm -hmm. And so they'd send the kids to mass most Sundays, but the parents wouldn't even go no a lot of way. Sundays. Yeah, it was, it was like Italian Boston wow. Catholics. Like that's what she, yeah. how she was raised. So she became born again evangelical at age mm -hmm. 20. Someone like gave her a Bible for the sure. first time and it like clicked for her. And so anyways, when our family was having this Catholicizing thing happen to us and I be, I'm becoming Catholic, my dad's becoming Catholic. Uh, my mom was like, okay, well, you know, I want to do what you guys are doing, but like I have all these hangups and does it really make sense? And right. she, she was going on this journey. And one of the things that I remember her sharing, like there was almost this aversion to just like what she saw as this very sterile, mm -hmm. even maybe judgmental, uh, you know, not full of God's grace and the Holy Spirit. Right like lifestyle religion, like it was a cultural right. thing. And, you know, Mary, particularly, I think there was like all the people with their, you know, you, yeah. you know that there's a stereotype that right. little old lady in the church with their, yeah. with their beads and the little rosary beads and everyone kind of, I think has their own vision idea of this. Maybe it's baggage or a hang up or a trigger, but maybe it's a positive thing too. But for a lot of people, maybe it's not a positive thing. And they look at it and they're like, that looks idolatrous yeah. or that just looks dumb or whatever they're thinking. Right. And, I and will, in a way, do you blame them? We got I got like th two pictures well, of the Virgin I mean, Mary you're, right here. Right. I'm in. He's, he's like repping it <laughs> I hard. Understand. You, you go I understand. Hard, you feel like we're idolatrous. Um, you're going it. hard, which is great. I get it. But but my mother now she prays the daily rosary. Oh, I love that. Yes. And maybe multiple sometimes. But oh my gosh. but I watched it and yeah. I wasn't in her shoes, but I could see her having this like dealing with this aversion and this yeah. like wrestling with it. But I watched her graciously have a humility where she's like, I'm gonna like just kind of let sit with this and like explore it. I think she was exploring it. And then I saw, I think it was really through going back to mass and like receiving the Eucharist and like sitting in front of the Eucharist, this new resurgence in her life. And now, I mean, my mother has always been a person I admire, has always been someone who's a source of wisdom and virtue that I look up to, but watching her since her reversion, if wow. we could call it that, yes. you know, her really becoming Catholic in terms yeah, of her living turn. it, it's been incredibly inspiring for me. And I know that that's a story for many other people and sounds like in many yeah, ways no, for you. So, so thank you for responding to his call and it. being so all out about it. Because well, like, don't hide the light under a bushel. You no are way. not hiding thank that you. light. Thank you, Gabe. Well, likewise it's, to you. I know beautiful. as you were speaking, I could just feel Our Lady's yeah. presence wrapping her mantle mm -hmm. around you. She's so pleased with you. She's so happy with Aww. all the things you're doing. Please keep it up. I'm praying for That's you. So you're doing amazing things. Thank you. How can, I mean, you have, we didn't even talk about your channel. How can sure. people find your channel? Your channel is very fun because oh, you do you. all the yeah. Catholic stuff, but you also do like vlogging and like all yeah, kinds I of Yeah, I do a lot of different things. I stuff. like variety. I can I like see variety. that. Yeah. Yeah. So my YouTube channel is called Gabi After Hours. It is unapologetically Catholic. So non-Catholics who first watch it, they're like, oh my gosh, this is kind of like a shock. This dude is like too Catholic. But I have found that once people kind of like get used to how you know, far I go, uh, they end up appreciating it and cherishing it. And then they become crazy Catholics as well. Have you done videos on like on the relics and going to see the dead body parts of yeah, dead I have bodies? A I have a, one of the best videos. It's if you want to go extra Catholic yes. guys, oh my gosh, go it's look at the befriending, dead. befriending the saints is what I call it. Okay. And it has an, expl <laughs> has an nice explanation of relics and Father Carlos is in it. And he of gets, course he he's is. like the best. He's the relics When Father guy. Carlos came on the yeah. show the other month, it was after he was coming from like some part of Southern California, just drove in. And he had St. Jude's leg. Was it his yeah, leg? Yeah, his arm, his arm. Oh, his yeah. arm? Literally of, the arm of, of body Saint, parts, yeah. A body part. <laughs> He's touring around and thousands yeah. of people are coming to yeah. be blessed with a body part, basically. Yep. And like, again, to your, your average evangelical, they're like, what? get me out of here. Yes. Like, this is, you know, <laughs> the, the, what is yes. this, right? This is insane. Yep. But you, once you enter in, you kind of understand what it all means in the context of the faith and, the, you know, the scripture and all this. And it just yeah, has become so beautiful. But yeah. maybe that's another day. Yeah, another <laughs> day, another day, another topic. But thank you. So ga thank Gobby, you. Gobby, Gobby, Gobby after, after hours. hours. And the reason for Gobby is because my mom is uh, fluent in Spanish and in 
Spanish Gabriel. The short is mm. Gabi. What so. does your mom think about all this? My mom is incredible. My mom is the holiest woman that I know. She's currently doing a holy hour right now as we speak. Wow. She's done two hours and of adoration. This, this was after moment. you came. Oh yeah. So, so after, you... my, after my conversion, I came, the first person I needed to bring to the Lord was my mom. Wow. And she said yes. And she's been saying yes. And she's been going deeper and deeper every wow. day. God is good. So See, beautiful. God is so good. He knows how much we so love our beautiful. family. Just like you with your mom. My mom is one of my biggest supporters. Beautiful. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you. God bless awesome. you. Awesome. A huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the world's leading Catholic network, reaching millions with the truth about the faith, entertainment, and news. Check them out at EWTN.com.